We often are using the same words and talking about very different things, right? I like to imagine a cocktail party at which uh, an art historian, a lawyer, and a physicist are talking about symmetry, right? I mean, this is, you know, this has meaning in each of their worlds, but it's not the same meaning to any great degree. So that's what, that's what I love about it, because it creates these chance pileups of meanings, but it's also what we have to work against by looking a little bit more at, at how we're using our words instead of just instinctively uh, barging on and, uh, and using them. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the history of talking about metaphor, since that's after all where we're beginning and what we're circling around. And I thought I would spare you a reference to Aristotle, because this is the <laughs> University of Chicago where we brush our teeth with Aristotle first thing in the morning. Uh, and you know, as you know, uh, the good old Aristotle gave us the term metaphor, but there are other things that we can do with it. Let's, let's start with a different sort of example. So I'm wondering, you know, how do we know that something is a metaphor? Or to turn our attention elsewhere, what are we doing when we designate something as a metaphor? In my experience, what we're doing is not just one thing, it's several things. So consider Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Right? There are several things in this picture that we'd recognize as metaphors. Right? And here, the way that we recognize them as metaphors is, as Daniel was saying, it would be misleading if we represented them as being simply the truth. Right? If you think that God is an old man with a beard and a pink nightgown, <laughs> that will make the rest of your life rather complicated. Uh, nonetheless, there are things here in the picture that, have, that are metaphorically presented and which we can derive a meaning from very quickly, right? Adam is looking very passive and helpless and he's naked and God is clothed and he's got company and he's got a lot of strength and so the antithesis between the two is very vivid to us and gives a kind of metaphor for the relationship that Michelangelo is trying to, uh, to bring across. So um, another thing about metaphor is that it has a somewhat uh, dubious history, right? Again, related to the issue of theological anthropomorphism, right? People have always looked at theological language and said, this is a tissue of metaphorical nonsense, right? You know, old men in pink nightgowns all over the place. And there are many moments in the history of philosophy and literary theory where people blow the whistle on metaphors. Here's one of the more famous one, ones, a, uh, a little text written by Nietzsche in 1873 when he was a professor of rhetoric at Basel and never published in his lifetime. It came out only sometime after he was dead. But here uh, Nietzsche is saying, all this stuff that we think is experience and knowledge it's not really that. And what is it? Well, here's what he says. A nerve stimulus transposed into an image, metaphor. The image imitated by a sound, right? When there is a word to name the thing that is conveyed by the image, another metaphor. And each time, he says, there is a complete overleaping from one sphere right into the middle of a new and completely different one. Right? We think we know, things, know about things themselves and all we know is metaphors for things. Right? You've, you've probably encountered this argument before. And then he rises up to his own uh, mad dash of metaphor and says, what then is truth? A mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms, and so forth. And I'm amused by the career of this passage because uh, the members of the Deconstruction Club, in which I have a, a membership card from many years ago, uh, I still keep up my membership, uh, but members of, of my club, tend, they, they're very uh, careful to interrogate and question absolutely everything, but when, whenever this passage is run up the flagpole, people simply salute it, right? <laughs> Even hard to please readers like Jacques Derrida and Paul de Mont, they just, they just quote this and say, yep, yeah, that's pretty much the way it is. All right, all right, Make, next example, please. So that, there is a kind of a funny island of, uh, of language that doesn't need to be questioned in the sea of things that need to be questioned, <laughs> and precisely because it says truth is metaphor. And that's a debunking gesture, right? That's a way of saying you thought it was truth and it's not truth. Let's go on and look a little bit more at Nietzsche's examples because there's one that interests me particularly since we're talking about, about gesture and about sign languages. He says, one can imagine a man who is totally deaf and has never had a sensation of sound and music. 
Perhaps such a person will gaze with astonishment at Chladni's sound figures. Perhaps he will discover their causes in the vibrations of the string, string and, and will now swear, I'm sorry, not sweat, will now swear that he must know what men mean by sound. It is this way with all of us concerning language. And of course, by, by raising this example, he wants to say, the man does not know what we mean by sound. Well, Chladni's Klangfiguren, his uh, images of sound, this is a famous scientific experiment, you may have encountered it before, published in 1787. Chladni had uh, flat plates of copper on which he scattered sand, and then he, he had a violin play loud notes next to them, or maybe he played the, the copper plate directly with a bow, but different notes caused the sand to arrange itself in different patterns, owing to the different kinds of vibrations of the copper plate. And so this is what his, his illustration here is showing you. So you might say, okay, you know, uh, there's the note D flat, and there's a certain pattern here. But to follow Nietzsche's metaphor, the man who thinks that the note D flat is that pattern. He would be dreadfully in error. He would merely be following a metaphor and not the truth. But of course, there actually isn't anything wrong with saying that that pattern is the note D flat, right? Chladni is talking about the fact that s sound and certain visual phenomena are linked by having a common cause in vibration, in particular frequencies of vibration. And so his Klangfiguren are simply a different output of the same thing. So Nietzsche's attempt to say they are totally different, there's no relation between the two of them, actually falls short of its objective. And I think you know, we want to say with Nietzsche, or, sorry, against Nietzsche and, and with Chladni, uh, he's not arguing, of course, against Chladni. I'm just bringing him in as a, as a, a nice person who has a good name. But mm, if we wanted to argue pro-Chladni and anti-Nietzsche, we'd say, actually, there's no metaphor here. It's the same thing, just taking different forms. I was delighted a few seconds ago to see in Daniel's last slide that Barbara Tversky is one of the advisors on his project. This is a psychologist whom I used to know at Stanford and whose work I always follow with great interest. Uh, Barbara talks about the mind community and the body community as having basically different agendas. Uh, there's a, a lovely essay that I quote here where she says, to caricature the approaches, the emphasis of the mind community is to reveal the systems generating error, and the emphasis of the body community is to reveal the systems generating precision. Let me give you a little bit more quotation so you can see what she means uh, from the same essay. She says, the, uh, uh, the mind community studies spatial judgments. The questions they ask are cleverly chosen and designed to yield errors. For the mind group, being human is fundamentally about limitations. Limitations in representations and in processing, in capacity and in computation. These limitations can be revealed in errors. But for the body group, being human is fundamentally about evolution and learning, selection and adaptation, pressures toward perfection. The body community, in contrast, studies the cues, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, vestibular, that people and animals use to arrive at their destinations. The research reduces the sensory input and diminishes environmental richness in order to isolate the role of a particular cue or system in guiding the organism. So, to sum up, the, um, the interest of people who are more on the psychology side of this discussion are trying to learn what the mind is by coming to see how it is at odds with the world or different from the world. That would reveal the specificity of the mind. But the people who are interested in bodily wayfinding learn what the body does by coming to see how it integrates itself with the world and with clues in the world. We might look back at Nietzsche and see how he would be classified, and of course he falls right into the camp of people who have the obsessions that Barbara characterizes as belonging to the mind community. He's a pessimist of metaphor. Right? Metaphor for him is the, is the sign of an error. He's interested in how we go wrong. That's what, how we might learn something about the mind. But let's think with Barbara about the communities that are committed to optimism or pessimism about cognition metaphors maybe being a subset of the cognition issues. So 
the use of the term metaphor that is current among my people, literary scholars and rhetoricians and theorists of knowledge, tilts sharply toward the goal of unreliability. Right? If you say something is a metaphor, you're claiming that its grip on the world is reduced. Uh, you might gain something else. You might gain something about subjectivity or creativity, but you would be losing the, the factual nexus. But among people who are interested in gesture and bodily action, this is a, a body community to extend Barbara Tversky's definition that would include many phenomenologists, cognitive science, linguists, and scholars of such arts as folk navigation and mnemonics. Among these people, there's optimism about metaphor. Metaphors here function as discoveries that propel action forward rather than as collapsing bridges that frustrate it. And I have here an example from uh, Mark Turner, who is, uh, as you see, he's narrating how something happens. And for him, this series of events which are connected, they're different events, but they're connected, are, it's legible. You can read it backwards and forwards, right? The, the woman throws the rock and breaks the, w breaks the window. We see the broken window, and we then think back to the broken rock and to the arm that threw it. Right? It's, uh, it correlates, I think, rather nicely with the Nietzsche passage, only it's trying to say something completely different. Right? It's somewhat in the same structure, but with a very different point. And Mark Turner, as a, an epistemological optimist, says, we can imagine the intermediate sequence in the story. Right? And that would always be true for any two points of a story, according to Turner. Whereas for Nietzsche, between any two points in the kind of epistemological story that he's trying to tell, you can only say another metaphor, right? another alienation, another falsehood. Uh, Turner uh, exp continues to develop his optimistic account of, of how story grammars work. He says the abstract narrative structure is projected to create the abstract grammatical structure. So you see you have grammar doing certain things and narrative doing exactly the same things. So the difference is merely one of scale. You know, I think many people in my usual frame of reference would be trying to find incompatibilities between grammar and narrative, right, or, or points of friction. Uh, he says, the abstract narrative structure includes an agent, an action, an object, and a direction. And I could cite you many more passages of, uh, of our old friend Nietzsche and of the many people who like to cite Nietzsche saying, there is no agent or doer of the deed. Rather, there is simply the deed. And we make poetically, uh, is this hinzugedichtet, that we add a doer to the deed, he says. Right? So that would actually... Uh, form uh, an almost exact correspondence with, uh, with Turner on the literary mind. And so in uh, what I, I think of as his supreme utterance of this kind of, of optimism, Turner says, story and grammar have similar structure because grammar comes from story through parable, a term that he uses to mean a kind of schematic narrative, right? a reduced narrative that, because of being reduced, is extremely mobile and fungible and reusable. Now, how does this relate to uh, Daniel Casasanto's papers? I class him among the body optimists because he's interested in wayfinding, in signaling, in parsing with voice, hands, and posture. Right? His, his, uh, the people he interviews are trying to make their language more accessible, more understandable for the people who hear them and perhaps also for themselves. Right? Because just as we often think out loud and then discover what we were thinking about something, we might also have to gesture in space in order to decide what we think about something. Uh, now, uh, how this happens though, this, uh, this parsing, wayfinding, or signaling with the, with the voice and the hands and the posture, uh, I would hesitate a moment before giving it the, the name metaphor simply because of the way that the word is loaded, uh, again, among my people with this uh, implication of falsity. Uh, and I, in, in hesitating before calling it metaphor, I'm really doing the same thing as I was doing a moment ago when I said, let's not call the Chladni vibrations metaphors. For often it seems that what is going on is not the body giving a representation or an image of a meaning that's conceived by the mind, but rather a meaning or feeling emerging simultaneously and bifurcatedly in mind and body. 
And here I want to push a little bit on the the normal understanding of gesture, right? There's a sense of the iconicity of gesture that relies on an idea of mimesis as imitation, right? If, I, if I'm going to talk about tall mountains or flowing water, you know, the, there's a, a, an expectation that my gestures, if they are to be truly iconic, have to be imitations, instantiations, dancings out of, of the objects. But Maybe it's not so much gesture in that sense, a kind of representation of objects, as it is gestures originating in postures. Postures are, are meaningful to me. A posture is meaningful to me as a different kind of word because posture is not quite so easily assimilatable to metaphor. It seems to have to do more with, with uh, context, with ethos, with uh, attitude, with angle. Right? And also, if you, if you want to think back to Latin and Greek, which is how I do what I think is thinking, uh, I would say, what is posture in Greek? Well, it would have to be hexis, right? Which means, you know, a way of holding oneself. It's actually a middle voice term. Let's see. I think I've jumped ahead of myself in a slide or two. What happened to those? Yeah, I'll come back to the things I just jumped over, right? Uh, but hexus and habitus are both derived from the middle or passive forms of verbs meaning to have. And so they implicitly involve the subject in a context, in, in a situation of, uh, of acting. And habitus, as you know, is one of the magic words of Pierre Bourdieu, so that's, that's a good endorsement to have too. So let's think about what we do. We might make gestures, right? Let me make the gesture of spaghetti, let's say, right? Or I make the gesture of this talk has gone on too long, right? That's different. But if I inhabit a posture that's, you know, my own body is reflecting something about how I am in the world. Maybe I'm holding my head high and standing up to strive with the world or else I'm feeling beaten down, right? That's, that's what's involved with, with posture. So maybe that's really the, the gestural or postural etymon of the up-down distinction, right? It's not just up is good, down is bad, but you know, up is alive, and down is heading toward that other thing. Okay. Um, let me go backwards a moment here. Uh, I'm interested in interference. Let's see, yes. Interference, uh, as in the famous example, well, the example famous to those who read the papers for today's talk, in which uh, Casasanto et al. had people moving marbles either up or down while, they're, while they were telling autobiographical stories and the up or down direction would correlate or correlate with or actually influence the tonality, right, the tenor of the stories that they told about themselves. I think this is a marvelous example uh, and it admits of a kind of an interference, right, in which, you know, perhaps your life was absolutely happy up until now but because I asked you to put marbles down as you tell about it, you're going to give me a, uh, a, a pessimistic take on your life, right? So that, that might seem like a kind of a mind community version of how the body would be influencing our thinking or our narrating. Uh, and with, with gesture though, with the kind of parsing gestures, the, uh, the co-gestures that are another part of his discussion, we're taking the spatial context, making it into part of the vehicle of the argument, and that seems to me to belong squarely in the body community, in which we're interested in subjects doing things with words and with properties and with the space between them and the people they're talking to. I think there's also a useful distinction uh, in, uh, in Saussurean terms between the long, right? There might be a, a sort of a weak constraint of lattices among the many lexical and phonetic items that are contained in a long that might tilt the environment one way, but there's a very different kind of relation in parole when somebody is speaking and performing and maybe using those, uh, you know, those uh, differentiations. Let's, uh, oh, and one other thing too, uh, by the way, with the, with the marble experiment, I was reminded of another famous experiment, uh, not I think performed by your, your group, but in which, I think you've probably read about this, in which uh, subjects were uh, asked to hold a cup of hot coffee in their hands and look at pictures of people and say whether they found them likable or not. 
And it turns out that if you have a cup of hot coffee in your hands and you look at even, you know, say Richard Nixon, you begin to say, yeah, Nixon, you know, he had his quirks, but he was an okay guy, really, you know, which is not the kind of thing that I would say uh, in most circumstances. And I think this result, by the way, is profoundly disquieting because it, it seems to call into question our ability to make independent political judgments, you know, so democracy begins to get anxious, and also, you know, judgments about the people that we might, you know, espouse or, or work with or whatever. So this, this experiment is a, is a way of, uh, of kind of calling into question uh, whether, whether or not we have that thing that we have traditionally called mind uh, quite independent from the body, and if we don't have it in the maximal sense that we're trained to think that we do, then in some areas of our lives we're in trouble. And that's an interesting kind of question to raise. And so here, uh, quoting from the Casasanto and Bottini piece, uh, the linguistic metaphors change the thoughts. They have an interactional relationship with the thoughts, and it's not a single relationship. That I like because uh, I think it's very important uh, not to turn this into a kind of a determinist argument, right? And say that, you know, there's. There's only this choice about up and down. There's only this choice about high vowels versus low vowels. And in fact, it's not quite about that. Um, I instead, I the, uh, the discussion that they're fostering is about engaging with the multiple levels of, of language and gesture. Um, I want to, since, since we're thinking about rhetoric, I would propose another term, uh, an alternative to metaphor, which would be catachresis, right? Catachresis is the trope where you give something a name borrowed from another thing, but it's not a substitute for a pre-existing name. You give it that name because there isn't another name for it, right? So, you know, when, when the physicist said that quarks had charm, for example, they were performing a catachresis because there was simply no, no word available to designate whatever that property was. Um, and one, one of the things that distinguishes the Casasanto research from the kind of argument that our friend Nietzsche was making, an argument nonetheless that often accompanies the term metaphor, is that he is not saying that metaphors are simply dispensable, detachable, outward clothings of, of concepts. Right? And I've included here the little beard on Michelangelo's God as you know, an example of the kind of thing that, of course, it's negotiable. You don't have to have a beard on God. If someone says, why does he have a beard? You can say, oh, that's merely a symbol for you know, the, the timelessness, the immense antiquity of God, whatever, right? doesn't have to be a beard. Um, I also like the fact that in some of these experiments people are, are trained and in a very short space of time to map space in a Chinese way. Right? There's far too much work in which, uh, to my mind anyway, language is treated as a kind of a cognitive destiny. Right? You might have seen the very recent and much trumpeted work in which languages that have a future that's not distinguished from a present <coughs> dramatically, uh, these people are supposed to be better at saving money because the future is right upon them. And I just think that's very silly. Now, some, you know, some, some people may have a better argument for that, but uh, as I read that, that seems to be uh, much, too, uh, much too deterministic. But instead, the watchwords are flexibility, pluralism, and adaptation. And that's also where I like the discussion of fluency and disfluency as predisposing us to like to do the things that we do well. Right? It's not just a matter of you know, yes or no, right? But sometimes the, the obstacles and frustrations are things that we do learn how to, how to handle. Um, right? Here, something I would worry about, there's a, another term that I think is wandering in from the pre-existing discourse, uh, and that, that term is innate, right? The propensity to link up and down with positive and negative may be innate. Uh, you know, right? Our friend Noam Chomsky is interested in whether or not Grammar is an innate property of the human mind. But I'm not sure that that's even the right term to use, right? It could be that people absolutely are born with blank slates as far as up and down are concerned, but experience starting on day one when they encounter gravity in this strange milieu where we live uh, begins to teach them that up is different from down, right? So I would, I would uh, retire innate if it were up to me. All right. Uh, let's see, yeah, 
already dealt with this, about Mandarin. Here's my chance to pick a bone because it's true that when we say last month or next month, we say shang yue, xia ge yue, right? But if you talk about the day before yesterday, it's qian tian, the day after yesterday is hou tian, and you even have da qian tian, da hou tian. So those, those extensions of priority and posteriority don't use the same metaphor of up and down, but it's rather before and, and after, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just, you know, it, it gets more complicated, and it, sh and it would seem to indicate that Mandarin speakers, again, in the cradle, are initiated into more than one line of sequencing when they talk about time. And then there's some, some people who I think might be interesting to talk about in this set of contexts. Uh, my reading in this area is pretty random, but uh, I've, I've always found it rewarding. Uh, Lisa mentioned Mark Johnson, The Meaning of the Body, and his several other books on the same sort of topic. There's also Francisco Varela with The Embodied Mind. Uh, and there are philosophers who are very interested in, in embodiment and in fact go beyond embodied and now talk about inactivism. And we have radical inactivists. Uh, I'm not quite sure what they're getting out of the, the use of the term radical, but let's let them have it. Um, you know, there, there are obviously, there's some discussions going on in the zone between neuroscience and philosophy that, that probably have something to contribute here. Um, However, I don't, you know, I don't think that this kind of interdisciplinary context is well served by just reducing everything to one great big swimming pool, right? I like distinctions, and so I am refreshed and pleased to see Casasanto et al. saying, evidence for metaphor theory is not necessarily evidence for embodiment, right? So I think, I think that's wise and uh, probably accurate, and it also, points to an area in which we probably have something to contribute according to our various sorts of reading. And I think that's all I had to go, I had to contribute for today. <laughs> <laughs>